All right, let's get started, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Tim Healy, one of the founders of TNT Dental. We are excited about tonight's presentation, geofencing and other data-driven techniques for growing your dental practice. We work with Simplify as our go-to partner for programmatic advertising. Our speaker tonight is David McBee. David is the director of training at Simplify. David is an internet marketing speaker, educator, and consultant who has been sharing knowledge with local businesses since 2003. As one of Google's first certified AdWords trainers, David has worked in the fields of SEO, paid search, social media, and display advertising. He speaks to thousands of business owners each year about the latest in marketing technology, geofencing, and targeted display. We have a lot of clients with us tonight. Thank you. But if you're on this webcast and you're unfamiliar with TNT, let me just mention that we are a digital marketing agency working exclusively with dentists across North America, and this year marks our 20th anniversary in business. Now that you know a little bit more about our presenter and TNT Dental, I'm going to turn it over to David. Welcome, David. Thank you, Tim. Can you're you welcome. hear me all right? I can. All right. Well, I'm just going to jump right into this story of geofencing and other data-driven techniques for dentists. Uh, I know it's been a long day for everyone, and so I want to respect everyone's time. I'm going to zip through this. If you have questions throughout the, uh, the webinar, you should be able to find a, uh, a question field in the GoToWebinar interface. Feel free to submit your questions there, and we will get to as many of those at the end as we can. If you uh, if you have any trouble hearing me, send a chat, send a question, and uh, the other admins will let me know. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to know who here has been retargeted. Now, you, obviously, you're all muted, so you can't answer back, but I'm going to assume that you've been delivered some kind of an ad that was specifically targeted to you based on your personal interests. It's really the way that display advertising on phones and computers and even a little bit of connected TV is starting to happen, right? Um, you know, a great example would be when I was building my Jeep. I started, to, I was shopping for Jeep wheels and Jeep tires and, and bumpers and, and all the things that, you know, guys wish they could put on their Jeeps. And of course, I started to see a lot of ads for those things. You probably see that in your own life. Maybe you see... Uh, ads for a vacation that you're planning or ads for golf clubs that you want to buy or a car, obviously. Um, it, it happens all the time and it's a really good experience. The reason it's such a good experience is because the internet is free and we have to see ads anyway. And so for us as consumers to see ads that are relevant to our interests or our behavior or our latest shopping, uh, that's good for us instead of seeing ads that are irrelevant. It's also good for the advertiser because that way they are wasting less ads on prospects or potential customers or potential patients uh, who are not interested in, in shopping from them, buying from them. Um, so that's really the, the, the main theme behind tonight's uh, webinar is putting a relevant ad in front of a relevant prospect, someone who has shown through their online behavior their location data, or even their offline purchase history that they might be shopping for a dentist. Uh, before I move on, though, just a real quick story. I have to tell you guys this. Um, I asked a room full of people once who had been retargeted, and I got the best story ever, so I have to just share this with you. A uh, lady raised her hand, and she said she had been dating a gentleman for a little while, and he had really bad taste in, uh, in jewelry, and she thought, well, he's going to propose, and I'm going to hate the ring. So she got on his computer, started shopping for the ring she wanted, and of course, he started seeing ads for that ring, and I swear this is a true story. He actually proposed uh, with the ring that she had shopped for, and I tell you that because if the webinar goes downhill from here on out, I want you to at least know that when you get off the computer tonight, you can go get on your spouse's computer, shop for the stuff you want, and maybe she'll get the hint, or maybe he'll get the hint. <laughs> All right. So... This idea of getting targeted is really based around this idea of digital breadcrumbs. It's kind of a term I made up to really show you how when you surf the web, when you shop online, when you interact with the internet, 
you leave these digital breadcrumbs that uh, become a part of your profile. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. Now we're gonna imagine that I'm a shopper and I've gone to Google. That's where we all start our searches, right? We all start at Google and we type some keywords into this box. So here's a great example of something someone might type into a Google search box. When should kids start seeing a dentist? When kids should start seeing a dentist, right? Now, Google has access to that data. They're not really willing to share it, but that's okay because what happens is we go to the first page of Google and we normally click on the first result. So in this example, it's WebMD. Now I go over to WebMD, and what I'm about to show you are all the digital breadcrumbs associated with me visiting this website. For example, there's the keyword dental appointment right there in the middle of the page. If a person's visited this page, there's a very good chance they're looking to schedule a dental appointment. They're in the URL at the very, very top. You can see the keywords that we Googled originally. When should I take my child to the dentist? Of course, the word dentist is right there in the title of the article. The word uh, take my child to dentist is in the title tag of the website. So all of these things are the digital breadcrumbs. In other words, every website that you visit knows a little bit something about you simply because you showed up on their website and they have all these wonderful keywords, right? Dental visit, dentist chair, dentist, they're all over the place. Now I go back to Google, I click on the second result because that's what we do, right? I'm a parent, I'm trying to figure out where I should take my kids, when I should take them to the dentist, I should say. And here again, we see go to the dentist. We see the word dentist in the title. We see dentist in the URL at the top, um, right up here in the top corner in case you missed that. Um, there's all sorts here, plaque buildup or cavities. We know those are keywords associated with someone who's interested in dental health baby teeth you know if you're a pediatric dentist these are the ideal keywords that you want to reach a person uh, the word dentist again pediatric dentist i go back to page three and again this is just an example of how a person might surf the web and all the different things that they're going to see and do while they are on the web and the word dentist just keeps showing up so this person surfing the web has this digital profile, these digital breadcrumbs. And obviously, because they have visited these websites, we think that they are a good candidate to show ads for a dentist, right? And there's just so many of them. I keep hitting my next button and they just keep showing up. So that's the first kind of data that we deal with, online behavioral data based on keywords. And I want you to think about that for just a minute and I'm gonna ask you, have you ever typed a keyword into a search box that you weren't interested in? It truly is a good measure of what a person wants or what a person is interested in. So the, the very first thing we do is we target people who have surfed the web, shopping for, reading for, and searching for keywords that are related to your business. The next piece of data that we like to leverage is what's called geolocation data. And that's simply gathered from smartphones. And there, you can't turn on the news today without hearing about all the digital location data that's associated with our smartphones. So what you can actually do is you can choose addresses that are within driving distance of your business or wherever, and we can draw an imaginary geofence around these locations. So in this example, you might geofence one of your competitors. You might geofence uh, you know, a place where you know a lot of moms hang out. Um, and then if a person enters that location with their smartphone, there's a very good chance that we're gonna see that data in the smartphone and we can make them a part of your audience and start showing them ads for your business. And I'm gonna show you here in a moment what those ads look like. So that's the second piece of it is geolocation data. And again, if a person walks into that competitive office they are leaving some kind of digital breadcrumb because you know, 99 out of 100 of us have some kind of smartphone in our pocket with location data turned on. Now, in case you were wondering, this is what it kind of looks like when an app tracks your location. This is, um, this is actually my life on a Saturday, or I guess it was a Friday, right? And it shows, of course, there at the top, uh, I picked my son up from school apparently, uh, we went to uh, the dentist here, right? And it looks like we had a nice steak for dinner. That's pretty cool. And 
all of this data was simply gathered because I had the Google Maps or Google GPS location data app running on my phone. Now, Google will actually show that to you. You can go to your Google profile, you can look at your timeline, but almost every app does it. If you've ever downloaded an app, you've seen, hey, look, look at this, it's asking me for my location, and usually we grant it. And we have to grant it because, you know, the Bank of America app is not going to help you find an ATM if you don't allow it to read your location. The Chipotle app isn't going to allow you to find a new Chipotle. None of the GPS apps work. Um, the weather app, of course, you don't want to have to put in your zip code every time you check on the weather. So we as a society have deemed these apps worthy of providing our location data. So that's how the location data is gathered. Now, the next piece of data that is so important is what's called demographic data. Now, demographic data is not new to you. I mean, everyone knows what a demographic is. It's, it's males 18 to 35, it's females, it's, um, it's people who are married, it's people who have kids, it's people who have a, a, a 4,000 square foot home. There's all sorts of demographic data available out there. And most of it, comes from uh, self-reported information or offline purchase data or publicly available data. So that's another source of data. And I'll tell you what, uh, we ran some of this data on some of our uh, employees and it was smart enough to know we had animals. Um, one of our developers, it knew he had cats. Um, it knew that my mother-in-law lived with me. So all this data is out there. It's, you know, it's impossible to hide in 2020. So all this data about who you are, your, your gener your, a general feeling of how much your income is, it's not always perfectly accurate, but it's close. A lot of it's based on mortgage information, credit card information, uh, purchases that you make. So all this data is available and we use it all to target your audience. Now, this is just a recap of all that data so that if I've been kind of going all over the place, we can kind of bring it back. So the online behavioral data is based on the keyword searches that you do and the websites you visit. The location data comes from GPSs on smartphones. The offline purchase data comes from credit card behavior, mortgages, taxes. Demographic data is public and private sources and even self-reported data that you might've put out there. And then <clears throat> of course, publicly available data, that's all out there in the county recorder and, and public record data sources. So we have all this access to data and we leverage it to target the right kind of clients for you. We want to create what we believe is a relevant audience. Now in the past, if you've done any kind of traditional media, and I sold traditional media, I've bought traditional media, I'm a fan of traditional media, but we all know that when you put a billboard up on the side of the road, 99 out of 100 people are going to ignore the billboard. They aren't going to notice it. They're not going to see it. Or they already have a dentist they love. We do that because we know if we get just a fraction of those people driving by that billboard to call us, there's a positive ROI. Well, in the world of targeted advertising, our goal is to cut back on the, on the waste, eliminate the waste. We show the ads to a whole lot less people but those people have shown through their behavior, their location data, or their demographic that they are the right kind of target for us. So we build this relevant audience for you. Now I'm gonna take you through the targeting capabilities. And I've broken them out today because this is an educational webinar. And I want you to understand how these work. But I also don't want you to get too caught up in which targeting capabilities make sense for your business, which ones you like, which ones you wanna use, which ones you think make the most sense. Because at the end of the day, what we're gonna to look to do is probably create a blend of these capabilities or, or put the ingredients into this recipe so that you get the final order, if you will, that's customized for your business. Now, here's what they look like. The first kind of retargeting is called site retargeting. Now imagine that I am the owner of Happy Smiles Dentistry for Children. Now when people come to my website, there's a stat that Google put out there that says 97% of first time visitors to my website will not take action. Now that's a painful thing for most business owners to hear if you're doing paid search and you know those clicks cost three or four bucks a piece and 
for every hundred people that come to your website, only three people are really gonna take action, that's painful. So what we wanna do is we put a little piece of code on your website, and then when the people leave the website, we show them ads reminding them that they visited our website and hoping that we can convince them to come back. Site retargeting is not a, a new tactic. It's not even a sexy tactic. It's probably one you've seen quite a bit of. If you've ever been to Amazon or Nordstrom's or you've ever shopped for shoes or glasses or a vacation online, you've probably been site retargeted. So I won't spend too much time on that one. It's an important tactic, but it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Person visits your website, they leave, we show them ads. The next kind of tactic is search retargeting. And we looked at this a little bit. They're in the middle of the screen. You can see that I'm on the My Mayo Clinic website and I've typed in the words children's dentist exams. So websites like the Mayo Clinic, and I can't speak for them specifically, but websites like the DIY Network and Mayo Clinic and, and, um, and WebMD, what they do is they capture these keyword searches and they sell them. It's a way that they make money. So we can see if a person visited this website and typed the word children's dental exams into that search bar, and that's called search retargeting. The next one is keyword contextual targeting, and that's really all about the keywords that are in the context of the page. And so again, in the beginning, I showed you quite a few examples of what that looked like. So if a person is visiting healthychildren.org and they're reading about baby's first tooth, we recognize that as a person who is a potential prospect for a pediatric or family dentist. Geofencing, of course, we spoke briefly about that. If you want, you can draw geofences around all the other dentists in your neighborhood, in your city. And if a person visits those other dentists, we can see that from the location data on their phones, and then we can start showing them ads. And we take that a step further, which I'll show you here in just a bit. Here's, a, here's an example of that. So I'm Happy Smiles Dentist, right? And I know that Fails Pediatric Dentistry is, uh, is you know, down the road. And I'd like to convince the patients uh, that visit Fails to, to maybe consider coming to Happy Smiles. So I can draw a fence around their location. And if a person enters that location, then yes, then I can show them ads. Then, by the way, if that same device that we saw in what's called a target zone, this is a target zone geofence, if it comes to my location, my Happy Smiles Dentistry location, uh, which I've now built another zone around it called a conversion zone. And if I see that device in both zones, I can actually measure that as well. So it's the ability to measure foot traffic conversions all the way into your office. And that's a powerful thing to do. By the way, since we're here and we're talking so much about uh, location data, I wanted to share this stat with you that says that roughly 90% of people keep their location services switched on. So if you're worried about us having any trouble finding the, that enough data, there's plenty out there, believe me. The next kind of geofencing that we can do is what's called an event target zone. And it's basically a time specific target. So we can take, uh, like in this example, I've chosen to geofence a carnival, for example. Now that may or may not be a, a great option to target for a, a dentist, but the idea is that we can draw a fence around that city block or that parking lot or wherever it is, and we can tell, uh, we can tell our, we can basically capture that audience in that location during that time. So it's a time period and a location. You could target a baseball game. You could target a parade, you could target an art fair, there's all sorts of events that you could target. Now we don't suggest you use event targeting as a standalone tactic, it's a supplement on top of some of these other tactics, but it can be an effective one if there's an event coming up and you'd like to reach the audience at that event. The next tactic is called addressable geofencing, and it's basically this idea that if you have some kind of a list, maybe it's your client list, maybe it is a direct mail list that you've purchased, maybe it's a list of new home owners, right? Uh, people who have recently moved in. We actually have the ability to draw a geofence around their home. So think of this as the next generation of direct mail. 
direct mail is amazing and it's a very powerful tool for dentists um, but it also has a very short shelf life you know that direct mail ends up in your mailbox you look at it for a second and then it usually goes in the trash or the recycle bin with addressable geofencing we can see all the smartphones in the homes and we can continue showing them ads for 20 30 days on their devices and here's a kind of a peek at what that looks like this is uh this is uh the street where i live actually and i happen to know that those three homes that i've drawn geofences around have small children in them and so again i'm imagining i'm happy smiles pediatric dentist and i've purchased a list of homeowners who have small children which is by the way a list that we can help create for you and now we have the ability to see that there are children in those homes we look for the smartphones in those homes and then we start showing ads on those smartphones by the way we also have the ability to what do something called cross device matching so we don't just show ads on phones we also show ads on the counterparts of those phones be those iPads or uh, other kinds of tablets or laptop computers, desktop computers, even connected TVs. We have the ability to cross device match and show ads on those as well. So a great example of instead of targeting an entire zip code or instead of targeting a neighborhood, you're targeting just the homes with small children in them. And that's just one example of a kind of list that we could build. The demographic data that we have is uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned gender, age, and income, but there's actually over 500 different variables. And you'll you'll want to talk to someone at TNT about what that looks like and what you think the best ideal target market is for your dentistry pack practice. But there are a lot of different demographics out there. We can target, like I said, married, uh, homes that have children, uh, homes that have a certain number of children. We can target based on income. Uh, there's just a whole lot of different things. I mean, it, it gets really, really deep. Uh, these wouldn't be necessarily relevant, but just to give you an idea, we could target people who own a motorcycle or people who um, read the Bible, uh, people who are um, into self-help books. I mean, the, the, the list goes on. And this demographic data, of course, comes from our offline purchase behavior. I've got a photograph here of a person buying toys so we're gonna assume that this is probably a mother and that's the probably the ideal target for that pediatric dentist that I've been using in my example. Okay, so what do these ads look like? You, you look at ads all the time. You, you see ad, we see hundreds of ads as we surf the web, as we get out our phones. And, and so here's an example. Here's a website called comingsoon.net. I don't know if you've ever been on it or not. It looks at you know movies that are coming on. But it is an ad supported website it's a free website because they do advertising so this is a place that i could deliver my ads why would i deliver my ads on coming soon well remember i didn't really choose coming soon but the person visiting coming soon has exhibited some of that behavior that indicates they're my target market and that's true for all these examples here's a person who is uh, you know, on ESPN and they're checking out their favorite sports team. And of course, there's an opportunity to deliver them ads for Happy Smiles. Here's a person who is uh, you know, checking the weather on their phone and we can deliver an ad. They're playing a silly game on the phone and there's an opportunity for an ad. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of sites, a lot of apps that, that you could use. CNN, there's a possibility for an ad. We definitely deliver a lot of ads, and the reason we do that is because seven out of 10 hours that we spend on the web are now on mobile. Uh, here's a game called Words with Friends, and every time you clear a level, you're presented with an ad. So, you know, you don't have to pay for Words with Friends, and it's because it's ad supported. Um, if, you've, if you're wondering about these websites, like here's an example of one called v3.co.uk, and you probably never, want to show an ad on v3.co.uk. But again, the reason I chose this site, it's so random, is to help you understand that the person visiting this website either went to one of our events that we targeted, they're of the demographic that we're targeting, or their online behavior five minutes ago or five days ago was that they were searching for or reading about things related to a dentist. Uh, I think that might be my last example. Oh, no, there's there's also the opportunity to deliver short videos. And you've probably seen these 
where if you go to a site like the Food Network and you want to watch the uh, the video on how to cook the best barbecued ribs or whatever it might be, you might be presented with a 15 second uh, video ad before the before you're allowed to see your your video. And of course, if you have any kind of video assets or commercials of some kind, we can deliver those in this kind of environment. And that's true for OTT or connected TV as well. More and more often, these connected TVs are showing ads. You know, if you've got Pluto or Tubi or some of these sites that have ad supported shows, then we can show your commercials based on all the targeting that I've shared with you today. By the way, 85% of us are watching content on uh, connected TV these days. So let's recap kind of what I've talked about so far. We are targeting people based on the websites that they visited, the, the searches that they've done for products and services. We're targeting people who have read content related to what it is you do. We're targeting people based on real world uh, locations that they visit or their demographics or their offline purchases. If you're taking notes or you wanna grab a screen, uh, screen grab, this is the moment because this is the heart of what we do. If I could hear you right now, I would ask you, are these the kind of people you'd wanna put your ad in front of? And I feel confident that your answer would be yes, those are the exact right people to show my ads to. So how do we show them ads? We show them ads on their smartphones, their desktop and laptop computers, apps, uh, that has ad supported video as well as connected TVs and other streaming devices. Okay, now that is kind of what targeted display is and how it works. I'm going to shift gears for just a moment. You heard during Tim's introduction that I was a Google certified AdWords trainer. So uh, I came to the world of internet marketing via Google AdWords and search engine marketing was my baby for over a decade. I was I am absolutely a fan of helping business owners be on the first page of Google. So if you're sitting there listening to me talk about all these display ads and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm already on the first page of Google, I wanna applaud you. You have done something right with SEO or paid search and you need to be on the first page of Google. That said, I wanna open your mind to the idea that it might not be enough, okay? And the reason I say that is because as human beings, we spend a lot of time on the internet, but we truly don't spend that much time on Google itself. In fact, the average person only spends about nine minutes a day on Google. Now, do you guys spend more than nine minutes a day on the internet? I'm gonna assume that if you're a normal uh, person in our society that you probably do. I know I do, I know my wife does, I know my friends do, I know my daughter does. And here's some stats on that. The average person is now spending about six hours a day plugged into the internet. As you can see, TV still uh, holds the, the throne of traditional media with almost four hours. Radio is about an hour and 20 minutes, print 21 minutes. But over here on the other, uh, on the other uh, pie chart, we break that six hours out and you can see that we're, we're spending over three hours a day on our mobile devices, a couple hours a day on our desktops and laptop computers. And this, this statistic, this whole slide, I think is so important to share with you because even though we know we're on the internet a lot, sometimes we take it for granted and we don't think about the idea that all this targeting aside, all these wonderful things I've shared with you in the last 30 minutes, if I didn't have any of that, and I just said to you, people look at their phones for three hours a day, wouldn't you wanna put a billboard on their phones? I think we can all agree that's exactly where we need to have our advertising because that's where our clients and our prospects eyeballs are. Now, I'm gonna give you a few more wonderful stats about just how addicted we are to the internet. People interact with their phones over 13 times an hour. I don't know if you're multitasking or not, but I'll bet some of you have been looking at your phone on the side while you were listening to this webinar. And that's okay because we are junkies. We, we need our phone fix. Uh, you know, this one's a little scary. We actually touch our phones 2,600 times every day. And 47% uh, of smartphone owners say that their phone is, get this, something they could not live without. 
Uh, this next slide is about millennials. I don't know if you are a millennial listening or if you know millennials, but I found, I found this to be an interesting statistic. It says that when given the choice between their technology and their sense of smell, about half of millennials said they would give up their sense of smell. Now, I don't mean to pick on millennials. I've had a lot of millennials say to me that that is, a, that is a ridiculous statistic, but I've also had millennials look up from their phone after I've read this and went, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> so if your target market are millennials, we've got to be reaching them on their phones. 83% of us consider our location services crucial, and that is why we leave our location data on. And smartphones are such a big part of our lives that we are now using them as big screens. I, I've put this photograph up to kind of give you an idea of the fact that even though there's a big screen in this, in this person's living room, they can watch their phone, a movie on their phone or a TV show on their phone and still have about the same experience. Here's another great stat, 78% of us um, are using our smartphones to watch digitally streamed content. Then of course, the most important statistic of the webinar, 86% of statistics are made up. <laughs> All right, now let's shift gears one more time and talk about measuring results because as an advertiser, as a business owner, you wanna know that the money you are investing in advertising is working. And unfortunately, it's not always cut and dry. If you're doing paid search, you can get a pretty good report on what keywords people clicked and how much those clicks cost. And maybe you even have a form on your website and you can measure the conversion. But just about any other advertising that you do, you kind of hope. In fact, here's an example of a billboard. Now I'm gonna ask you, and I know you can't answer back, but answer aloud to yourself. When you drive by a billboard, what's the next thing you do? Do you stop what you're doing? Do you turn the corner and go straight to, you know, Village Ford in Bellevue? No, I don't want to. no probably not. Now, that doesn't mean this billboard doesn't work. In fact, Village Ford and Ford Lincoln of Ocala, they probably have people mention every once in a while, hey, I saw your billboard. But there's really not a good way to measure whether or not this works, is there? That's true of TV as well. You might hear somebody once in a while say, hey, I, uh, I saw your TV commercial, but it's not like they can click on your TV. And it's not like you can measure how many people came in from the TV ad. And certainly people come in and don't measure your commercial. Here's a person reading a magazine. Now what's she about to do? There's ads in that magazine. She's not gonna just shut the magazine and then run to Dillard's and buy that new purse, right? And if she does, Dillard's isn't gonna know it's because of the magazine. So how do we measure this? How do we even know if advertising works? It's kind of a, an obvious question. You can't for the most part. So what you do is you lean on overall metrics like these. You look at your website and you say, are more people coming to my website? Do I have more people visiting my store now that I'm running a TV ad or whatever it might be? Do I have more people looking for my brand? Do are, are people searching for me by name? Am I getting more phone calls? Am I getting those forms on my website completed? And overall, am I getting more customers? And again, this is not what you want to hear. You want to know, hey, I invested $1,000 in this geofencing thing or whatever it might be, and these are the exact results that I got. So out of one side of my mouth, I'm telling you, you kind of have to measure display like you do everything else. Out of the other half of my mouth, I'm going to tell you how we can measure actions. This is where I get really excited, okay? Because what we can report is pretty good. We can measure clicks. We can measure the click-through rate. Now, we don't hold a lot of, we don't put a lot of weight on that. And let me tell you why. The average click-through rate on a display ad is 0.1%. In other words, about one in every thousand ads gets clicked. Now, that doesn't sound very good. But again, how many TV commercials get clicked? zero out of a thousand, right? How many billboards get clicked? Zero out of a thousand. So it doesn't mean that they don't work, it just means people don't click them. And the reason they don't is because they're doing other stuff. They're checking the weather, they're playing words with friends, whatever it might be. They see your brand, they see your name, they remember it, but they don't always engage with you in that moment. Sometimes they go Google you later. Sometimes they visit your website and we call that a view through. That's someone who we delivered an ad to, 
They did not click it in the moment, but later on they visited your website. And that's something that we can measure as well. Uh, we can measure form completion. So uh, we can put a little pixel or a piece of code on your website where you have a form and we can measure that. There, there are some qualifications for measuring uh, uh, pixels on form completions, some minimums associated with that, but talk to your TNT rep about that. And then of course, the, uh, my favorite is geo conversions. And I mentioned that a minute ago when we have that geo conversion zone around your office and a person that we delivered an ad to visits your office, we can measure that. Uh, and then we have something called geo conversion lift. Now this is a little bit um, advanced, but you guys are dentists, you're smart. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what lift is. Here's how it works. Um, for whatever reason, I shifted from dentist to furniture for this slide, so you'll have to forgive me. Imagine for a moment that, uh, that you are the owner of this furniture deals business, right? And you have targeted the A&M home furnishings. You figure people visiting over there, they'd be good opportunity, they'd be good prospects for my furniture store as well. So this, this lovely lady is in A&M &M home furnishing. She's got her phone with her. We see her location data. We make her a part of our, our, our uh, target audience and we start showing her ads. The next day, three days later, six days later, whatever, she decides she's gonna come to your store. Well, now we've seen that phone in both a target zone and a conversion zone. So she is what's known as a campaign converter. And we can report that to you at the end of each month saying, look, we drove 12 or 20 or 30 or 50 um, devices that we saw in these target zones into your conversion zone. But what you might say to that is, well, I certainly didn't get 20 new clients. Um, how do I know that the ads had anything to do with them showing up at my, uh, my, my office? They may have wanted to come in anyway. You, you may have just targeted my own clients. So in order to combat that objection, and that's a smart objection for a business owner to make, we came up with something called geo conversion lift. So here's how it works. Not only do we measure the devices to which we showed the ad, for example, the, the, the lovely lady in the last slide, right? We actually measure all of the devices that we see in the target zones and the conversion zones. And this gives us kind of like a control group. A campaign converter is a device that was seen in the target zone, we delivered an ad to them, and then they showed up in the conversion zone. So those campaign converters, that's, that's huge. They, they were our perfect audience, we showed them an ad, they came into our office. But we also measure natural converters. Now we don't take credit for natural converters because their device was seen in the target zone, we did not deliver them an ad. We didn't get around to it. Maybe your budget wasn't big enough. Maybe there wasn't an opportunity to. Maybe they don't play a lot of games on their phone or they just aren't in apps that deliver ads. So we weren't able to deliver them an ad, but they show up at the conversion zone anyway. So that gives us what we call a natural conversion rate. And Lyft is the difference between the campaign conversion rate and the natural conversion rate, or said another way, we will be able to provide you a lift report that shows what percent more likely people are to show up at your office having been delivered one of your ads. It is a, one of the most powerful and amazing things about geofencing. Comparing the, the ad group to the non-ad group gives us that percentage and it really does show that the ads are making a difference. The ads are driving traffic to your location. All right, forgive me for just a moment. I need just a sip of water. <clears throat> All right, now let's look at uh, a couple of sa sample campaigns and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Uh, this is a furniture store that we ran. Uh, well, this is just a, a, an example of a, this is just a stock photo, right? But here's the, the actual campaign of the furniture store. First of all, this particular furniture store sold mostly chairs, love seats, outdoor furniture. Their sales ranged from two to $5,000. That's not super relevant as to uh, why we did our targeting or whatever, but I like to have those conversations to make sure that we have a positive ROI at the end of the day, right? The campaign delivered about 300,000 ads, 300,000 impressions in a, in a month, 
okay? And they saw approximately 40 geo conversions come in, okay? And the geo conversion lift was 197%. Or said another way, 40 people that we targeted in the target zones actually came to the furniture store. And the geo conversion lift proved that people who were delivered ads were 197% more likely to visit than the people who were not delivered ads. I love that statistic. And by the way, even if half of those people uh, came in because of the ads, and even if half of those bought something, this guy more than made a two or 300% ROI on his investment. And I say guy, I shouldn't say guy, it could be a woman that owns a furniture store. The next one is a grocery store. And the grocery store decided to run a blend of tactics. They did site, search, keyword, geofencing, and they targeted their competitors as well. They targeted the big lots and the Costco's and the save marks. They delivered 600,000 ads over the course of a month, and it drove 548 conversions into their eight locations for a cost of under $10 per visitor. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never gone to the grocery store and less, spent less than $10, I don't think, um, maybe once in a blue moon, but I mean, I can't hardly get out of there without spending three digits. So I feel like these numbers um, are a great indicator as to the positive ROI on this campaign as well. The last one is, of course, a dentist. And this lovely dentist ran a campaign where she ran uh, site search and keyword and geofencing tactics. The, uh, the locations she wanted to target were salons, gyms, boutiques, coffee shops. Um, her logic was, I don't really want to target my competitive dentists um, because I figured the people that are at those dentists already have a dentist. So we decided that uh, targeting uh, competitors in her case wasn't something that she wanted to do. She felt that moms were the decision makers. And so we targeted locations where she thought she could see a lot of moms. The campaign delivered 100,000 impressions each month. And this campaign was an ongoing campaign that ran several months. Uh, but in her first month, she saw 42 geo conversions for a cost of less than $25 per visit. She um, mentioned to me personally that her average client lifetime value is about $2,500. So when I showed her that the report sent 42 people in based on her advertising, she felt very confident that she was going to more than make back her investment in this campaign. So there's all this opportunity, all these hours that we spend on the internet, all these opportunities to reach people based on the, all the different data that I shared with you, opportunities to reach them on their connected TVs, their laptops, their apps, their phone, of course. And most businesses are spending only 13% of their media budgets on mobile advertising. Or said another way, this is a huge opportunity for you to get in on, a, on a, an advertising technique that so few business owners have truly embraced at this point. It's still so new to us and it's a huge opportunity. And with that, I will um, open it up for questions. I think the best way for you to submit a question is to use the question box in the GoToWebinar. And then I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, the guys at TNT to pick out the questions we wanna answer. So just unmute yourself and, and chat with me about what questions you wanna tackle. Perfect. Hey, so I'm Eli Milstein. I'm part of the Simplify team, and I'm here with Stephen Cantor, who's on the TNT team. So we have been looking at your questions you guys have been sending through and really appreciate that. Um, we're going to try and get through um, as many as we can, and any that we don't address, Stephen and his team will be able to send that out afterwards and help you guys uh, tackle these one-on-one. -on -one. So one of the first ones we want to talk about was what is the, this is from Sonia Sethi, what is the average low to high budget for these sort of campaigns and what sort of returns do you see? Um, Stephen, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So in, in terms of the numbers, the average spend per month uh, for one of our practices on the platform is uh, $600 per month. 
Uh, and then in terms of, um, you know, the, the ROI question, as, you know, David mentioned with these campaigns, there's uh, a lot of different means of uh, attributing business actions back to the campaign. And a lot of that is, you know, contingent, dependent on um, what you're running with TNT, what your other marketing programs are looking like. Uh, in terms of the optimization that the team uses, it's uh, $50 uh, cost per action uh, is the hard number. So um, another question we have here from Matthew Jeanette is how much do we have control over where or when the ads show up? Um, David, do you want to speak to that a little bit? I do. So there are certainly some controls. You could uh, you could use something called day parting to show your ads during a certain day or time, um, but we really discourage that. And, and, and let me help you understand why. Um, so I needed to get a, a fence for my home. We'd, ha we'd had a new dog and I wanted to get a new fence. And uh, of course I was very busy all day at work and in the evening we had softball or whatever. And I really didn't get around to uh, doing my research for the fence until late at night, 10, 10 30, sometimes 11 o'clock at night. And if you were that fence dealer thinking, oh, well, I want to reach people during the day, of course, you would miss me. What we don't want to do is assume when the person is shopping. We know the person was shopping at some point, whether it's 11 a.m. or 11 p.m., doesn't really matter. And then that device now becomes a part of our, our target audience. If that device gives us an opportunity to put an ad in front of them, we're going to take that at three in the morning or three in the afternoon. Because if that person's up at three in the morning and they're playing, you know, Candy Crush or whatever, and they were just shopping for a dentist earlier in the day, we want to take advantage of that. So the answer is yes, you can decide when, but we discourage it because there's not much point in it. If you were <clears throat> maybe a restaurant and you had breakfast ads and dinner ads, it might make sense to do that. But for dentists, we just want to get that ad in front of the person at any opportunity that we can. As for the where we deliver the ads, um, we also don't uh, encourage that you try and pick out what websites uh, or what apps because you never know what that person is going to like. Uh, I have an app on my phone called Ant Smasher. Okay, It's the dumbest app ever. The whole goal of the app is to smash ants on your screen. It's so dumb. So if I were to say to you, hey, let's let's run ads on Ant Smasher to be like, no, David, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And so I wouldn't say that to you, but I would say if a person was at a location that you targeted, if a person is the right demographic, if a person was just searching for a dentist and then tomorrow they're playing Ant Smasher, wouldn't you want me to show you their ad? So the answer to your question is yes, you can pick out some of the when and the where and the what but we highly discourage it because it's not relevant to the targeting. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, so we have another one here that we wanted to ask um, from Michelle Chiavola. And the question was, if we haven't done this type of marketing before, but would like to test it, what would be the ideal length of time to run a campaign? Steven, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So both in terms of what uh, the, the Simplify folks recommend just to get good data back from the campaign, uh, and then also what TNT usually recommends just to make sure that we have ample time to, to optimize and make uh, adjustments on our end, we say 90 days. A 90 day commit just to get a sense of uh, what, what we can do, make some strategic adjustments, uh, and then evaluate from there. Awesome. And you one- know, Eli, I'd like to add to that. Um, one of the reasons that we ask for 90 days is because the whole time that we're running the campaign, we're looking at those keywords, we're looking at some of those geofences, we're looking at the demographics, and we're seeing which of those actually perform the best. So if you gave us, say, 10 geofences, and we noticed that the fences that you put around Target, Target's a bad example because the word Target zone. So let's go with um, let's go with Starbucks, right? Every, you know, we drew a geofence around the Starbucks and we drew a geofence around uh, another coffee place and we never get leads from the Starbucks, right? So now we've learned that and we might eliminate that fence. And then we've learned that, oh, this yoga studio gave us a ton of great leads. 
So what we want to do is add more yoga studios. So really it's a learning process in those first 90 days. It's not, I'm not saying we won't get you great results right off the bat. There's a very good chance of that. But after 90 days, we have enough data that we can really truly start to make the campaign sing. I, I tell people all the time, it's not a matter of whether or not this tactic will work. It's just a matter of what we have to do to make it work. Awesome. Okay, so we have another one here. Um, should we replace direct mail campaigns with addressable geofencing? David, do you want to talk about direct mail and addressable a little bit more? Yeah, I'm happy to. So my answer to that is if your direct mail isn't working, if you're unhappy with your direct mail, if if you think you're wasting your money or you've saturated the direct mail market, then absolutely shift the budget over to addressable geofencing. But if your direct mail is working and a lot, and direct mail is still very solid in 2020, it's a great tactic for getting, uh, getting in front of people. I say, warm up the mailbox, run an addressable geofencing campaign targeting the exact same folks, put your ad in front of them, day after day after day for 30 days, then drop that direct mail piece in their mailbox. And when they get it, their reticular activating system, the, the, the part of their brain that recognizes stuff that's familiar, it's gonna say, hey, I know this dentist, I've been getting his ads on my phone all month. And that direct mail piece is gonna do better than it has ever done before. We've seen it happen, we've seen results improve when you combine addressable geofencing with a direct mail piece. And the inverse is true as well. You can drop the direct mail piece and then follow it up with addressable geofencing. So the direct mail shows up on Monday and then all of a sudden on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, they start seeing ads on their phone or their laptop for that same dentist. And it's very powerful to hit the prospect up using those two different mediums. Perfect. Okay, so we had another one come in um, specific to location data. So what happens if only certain apps have location services on? David, do you want to talk about that? Well, I can add to it as well. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if a person doesn't have some kind of an app running that doesn't have location on, then we may struggle to see that person in the fence. Most of the time, you know, you're not going to be able to afford to target every single device that reaches the fence anyway. So the handful of folks who don't have apps running with location services on, you know, we can't reach everybody. That's that's okay. I've got my phone in my hand right now, and I'm just going to do something. I'm just just going to pull up to see how many apps I have running. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh, twelve, fifteen, twenty. Oh, I just I just keep going on and on. I must have 35 or 40 apps running right now. And that is probably the norm. If those apps are up and running in the background, there's a very good chance that they're capturing my location data. So yeah, there's gonna be the occasional person that doesn't have those apps running. We might not be able to find them, but trust me, there's plenty of people who do, so it's not even a relevant you know, concern. Sure, yeah, and just adding on to that a little bit, you know, we we see about 92 percent of devices in the u.s and you know every day we're collecting location data from over 600,000 apps just minimum on a daily basis so they're you know the average user i think i've heard before has anywhere from 30 to 40 apps on their phone um, and we get location data from a large portion of those and i know david shared a stat earlier so it it really doesn't typically you know inhibit that and something else to keep in mind is the strategies that tnt has put together um, to reach the goals that their dental practices are looking at depend on all these different types of data that david has been speaking to um, so it's not just location data that we're dependent on we're capturing users in all different parts in their digital breadcrumb journey so we've got a lot to build off of here 
So there's a couple of others, um, like I said, that we will expand upon that um, Stephen and his team are going to address kind of individually. Um, I think there was one more that I wanted to touch on that the question was, can you please further explain the $50 cost per action that Stephen mentioned? Um, that action is defined by the goal of your campaign. Most typically, TNT campaigns are focused on new patient form fills on your website. Um, so there's a variety of other metrics that can be included there, including the visitors that you know have been talked about a lot during this presentation that we do measure for TNT campaigns. Um, but the, we, the reason why we use a broad term of action is so that we can define it for each individual advertiser. So that is something that's super helpful um, for you guys, especially as a collection of uh, dental practices that although you might all be dentists, you all have a unique skill set, a unique market, and a unique office. And so we try to speak to that as best we can. Um, so I think that's all we have on, on questions. Um, so this was awesome. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciated it. You're welcome. That was fun. Thank you. Well, great. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can send them over to TNT. And there will be a follow-up to this webinar as well with a recording, so you can go back and watch any of it, as well as some of these other questions that we didn't get to tonight um, that will be addressed um, for you guys. So thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a great night.